Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to the Wilson Center. My name is Andrew Rudman. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute, and it is wonderful to have you all here, many of you here present as we've returned to some in-person events and, and many others who are watching us uh, via the live stream. So welcome wherever you are. Um, I'm really happy uh, to be doing this event today. It's really exciting. Um, one of the first conversations that I actually had in, in this role as director of the Mexico Institute was with Dolia. And she mentioned that she had done interviews with the three most recent U.S. ambassadors to Mexico, following up on, on interviews she had done in the past. And did I think it would be a good idea to update that, update the book and include those interviews? And the fact that you're all here and you all have one of these suggests you know what my answer was. <laughs> um, but at the same time, what I didn't realize is that Ambassador Roberta Lejeune and many of her colleagues at Colegio de Mexico were finalizing their own book, which also talked about the role and experiences of U.S. ambassadors in Mexico. That book is called Embajadores de Estados Unidos en México, Diplomacia de Crisis y Oportunidades. Both books are available for download from the event page from the Mexico Institute webpage. And as you've all seen, Dolia's book is available in hard copy as well. So I hope if you don't have a copy that you'll get one. Um, and as it turns out, the book that Ambassador Lejeune wrote ends where the new part of Dolia's book begins. So there's a really good synergy between the two. Um, but that isn't the only reason that we thought it made sense to put these two books together and, and do this as a joint event. Um, but it's really because our speakers, the, the authors, but also our moderator and our panelists have all seen the U.S.-Mexico relationship from different perspectives. And I think having that conversation, <coughs> hearing their thoughts and experiences from those different viewpoints, if you will, will really be uh, enriching, <coughs> I, I think, a really enriching discussion. Um, we all know, I think, and, and certainly all of our panelists and speakers know the critical role that's played by the U.S. ambassador to Mexico in helping to manage and advance one of the U.S.'s most important, most impactful, and certainly at times most challenging diplomatic relationships. It's also one of our oldest, and I think you're all aware that uh, in December we'll actually celebrate 200 years of the bilateral relationship. So we thought that was also a reason to do this event uh, at this time, to start thinking about what does that uh, 200th anniversary, what does that bicentennial look like, and what has been and should be the role going forward for U.S. ambassadors. Obviously, Mexican ambassadors play a role, as do many, many others, including many of us in this room. Um, so that's basically why we got to where we are. That's, that was why we picked the topic that we picked and the time and, and uh, how we put this program together. Um, and now I, I really need to tell you who, who are these people, give you their bios so that we can, we can get started with the program. So starting with, with Dolia, Dolia Estevez, who I, I think is known to many, if not all of you here today, is a freelance journalist and author based here in Washington. She specializes in Mexico and the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship. She has reported for many outlets in the United <coughs> States and Mexico, including <coughs> Forbes, Noticias MVS, El Financiero, Poder Magazine, Sin Embargo, and Proyecto uh, Puente. I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Um, her lifetime work includes is much better high impact investigations of Mexican corruption, abusive power, and the drug war, as well as reporting on key developments that have helped shape the U.S. Mexico relationship to date. She's the author of two Spanish language books, El Embajador and Así nos ven, and co author of Donald Trump, El Aprendiz. She is also author of Journalism Across the Border, Shared Responsibility. U.S. Ambassadors to Mexico, The Relationship Through Their Eyes, and Mexico, A Challenging Assignment. U.S. Ambassadors Share Their Experiences. Uh, the latter two, of course, were published uh, here at the Wilson Center. Next, we'll hear from Ambassador Roberta Lejeune, who's a distinguished diplomat in the Mexican Foreign Service. 
She has served as ambassador to Austria, to Cuba, to Bolivia, and to Spain. She was permanent representative to the UN in Vienna, and all, uh, where she served as president of the International Conference of the IAEA. She was deputy permanent representative to the UN in New York. And uh, for the PRI, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, she participated in the presidential campaigns of Luis Donaldo Colosio and Ernesto Zedillo. Before she joined the Mexican Foreign Service, she lectured at UNAM in international relations, and she has a master's degree in Latin American studies from Stanford. And to moderate the discussion, which will follow the book presentations, happy to have with us Ariel Mutsatsos Morales, who is a journalist, communicator, and international affairs specialist, also based here in Washington. He's the US Bureau Chief and Senior Correspondent of Televisa NA Plus Network and Digital Media Platform. As a diplomat, he was Minister for Public and Special Affairs at the embassies of Mexico in the United Kingdom and here in the US. He also served as Senior Special Advisor to the Attorney General of Mexico. As a journalist, he was Senior International Correspondent in New York, Europe, and the Middle East for Detrás de la Noticia, a leading Mexican radio and TV newscast. His commentaries and articles have been featured on many news platforms, including the BBC, Radio Formula, El Universal, El Financiero, Bloomberg TV, Uno TV, and Excelsior. Ariel holds a bachelor's degree in communications from Monterey Tech and a master's degree on international relations from the Complutense University of Madrid. So we will hear from both of our authors. Ariel will ask them some questions. We'll then, Ariel will introduce our, our panelists or, or respondents, if you will, and they'll chat a bit, and then we'll have some time for, so, and, and Luis Teis, I apologize, Luis, who, who's joining us uh, via video, and then we will uh, have time for your questions, both from the online audience. You can either email those to mexico at wilsoncenter.org, or tag us on Twitter at Mexico Institute, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So with that, let me turn it over to Dolia to tell us about her book. Thank you so much, and you're welcome. Let's see if this one. I'm going to uh, record this so I don't go over. So, um, Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, the book we are launching today, this book, many of you or all of you have it, um, is, made, is made up of interviews with US ambassadors who were posted in Mexico over a period of 45 years. Uh, the interviews constitute the uh, centerpiece of the book. It is therefore not an academic text, nor is it an attempt to assess the performances of the ambassadors or analyze US foreign policy towards Mexico. It is rather an original work of journalism, journalism because that's why, who I am, that tells the story of almost half a century of US diplomatic relations through the eyes of these key actors they're very much involved directly uh, in Mexico. It is a forum to hear their voices and, is, and see Mexico <coughs> through their eyes. The book, as Andrew said, is an updated edition of the bo first book that, um, that Woodrow Wilson published that I authored uh, 10 years ago. It includes three new ambassadors Ambassador Tony Wayne, who is here today, thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Roberta Jacobson, and Ambassador Christopher Landau. A new prologue by Andrew, an updated uh, introduction, and a new title. Uh, each interview is a chapter. The interviews with Wayne, Jacobson, and Landau draw history very close to the present. With this, I conclude a 10-year ten ten year project of locating and questioning all living U.S. ambassadors who served in Mexico from the late 1970s to 2021. Some have passed away since then. Many hours of questions and answers offer a rare look into the scenes 
into uh, behind the scene events that determine the relation under four Republican and three Democratic administrations. Some ambassadors have spoke candid more candidly, less circumspectly, and with better recollection of the past than others. Their testimony suggests that the perception of the American ambassador as a figure larger than life or proconsul with unlimited access to the president has evolved as, as co the Cold War ended and Mexico became more democratic. Nowadays, access seems to depend more on the president's personal, personal style, but the derecho de picaporte is no longer the rule. For example, President Peña Nieto and López Obrador entrusted to their respective ambassadors, <coughs> to, to their respective foreign ministers, the relationship with the ambassadors. Towards the end of the Peña administration, all bilateral decisions were being made by Luis Videgaray and Jared Kushner. Neglecting traditional institutional channels such as the embassy and the State Department, as Jacobson, Ambassador Jacobson explains in detail in the book. Ambassador Jacobson said that she did not uh, try to see uh, Peña Nieto so much. I knew that at the end, she told me, Luis Videgaray was the guy to go to. Landau said he was told by Lopez Obrador that ambassadors deal with the ambassador. <coughs> ambassadors deal with the foreign minister, not with me. So that's what uh, Landau told me, he, Lopez Obrador told him. Ambassadors deal with the foreign minister, not with me. Well, he does deal with another ambassador. Uh, <coughs> Mexican political scholars found my book to be particularly useful because it offers an insight into the ambassador's perception of the president, the president they were, they were the Mexican president they were uh, working with when they were ambassadors. Ambassador Wayne, for example, said Calderon was more of a micromanager than a strategist, while Peña Nieto was a big picture guy. <coughs> Jacobson found Peña Nieto to be incredible, polite, and well-mannered. Landau described Lopez Obrador as being kind of similar to President Trump in the sense of both being very concerned about the country's sovereignty and putting their country first. Ambassador Jim Jones saw Carlos Salinas, and I quote, as having one foot in the old system and another foot in the new system <coughs> and never knowing which foot was where. <laughs> Ambassador Gen uh, John Negroponte said Carlos Salinas was like a CEO, very uh, businesslike. Some, some ambassadors said that despite a closer collaboration between the two countries, there's still a lot of ignorance and fragmented perceptions of Mexico among U.S. policymakers. When Kushner visited Mexico for the first time, for example, Jacobs has said his expression was, holy crap, it's like New York. <laughs> this is how she said it in this. I, I, I'm not going to edit my, my ambassadors. I mean, what they told me is what they told me. And uh, who am I to edit them? Uh, when Kushner visited Mexico City, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the same thing happened with other uh, visiting delegations, congressional visiting delegations. And this is again uh, Jacobson speaking. I think they thought it was going to be like donkeys and burros and shootouts in the streets, a combination of stereotypes. Jacobson speaking. Ambassador Jones said he was always astounded of how little Washington knew about Mexico, both, both the Congress, in the Congress, and in the administration. Ambassador David O. remembered uh, trying to explain to Colin Powell the specifics of the immigration reform. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he said Powell would go blank. As for Texans thinking they understand Mexico better than anyone else, 
It comes from growing up eating tamales and huevos rancheros, David Doe said. Jacobson believes it's not a total misunderstanding of Mexicans. She explained, even the positive views of Mexicans are two-dimensional. Americans don't really get much deeper than hardworking people and good food kind of thing. It's not a complete misunderstanding. It's a partial misunderstanding. Many of the ambassadors express, express frustration over coordination or lack of coordination be between federal law enforcement agencies dealing with Mexico and the embassy, particularly in moments of crises. After receiving orders from their bosses in Washington to do something stupid, as, uh, as Davido put it, Ambassador Davido said he would tell the DA and the FBI attaches in the embassy to blame him for not following their boss's orders. You tell them that the son of a beach ambassador refused to give you permission. That's Davido. Uh, <clears throat> that really was the most difficult part of my job, he told me, Davido. Of great concern was, of course, the tendency of the DA to go rogue. One recent example is the decision to arrest a Mexican general in California on drugs charges, which, according to Landau, was made by people in the Department of Justice without consulting the State Department or the Pentagon. Ambassador Gen uh, John Negroponte called the kidnapping of, Mexican, of a Mexican doctor by bounty hunters secretly hired by the DA agents in the, in the 1980s, the biggest, uh, the biggest irritant in the relationship under, uh, with Carlos Salinas. Ambassador Carlos Pascual was also emphatic in stating that neither the Department of Justice nor the Department of State knew about the ATF Fast and Furious operation that continues to create problems today. In conclusion, the book confirms that Mexico is not an easy place to be American ambassador. Too many actors and too many important factors that have direct domestic impact in the United States come into play. Diplomatic relations between the US and Mexico are often contentious. But as Secretary Blinken said yesterday, the relationship is secure enough to acknowledge those differences and work through them in very practical ways so we can serve the best interest of our people. The virtue of being normal. <laughs> Almost all of the ambassadors said that it was not, if it, that it was one of the most, if not the most challenging assignment of their public careers, but also the most rewarding and enjoyable. That's why I use, choose that title, challenging. Mexico challenging assignment. They all say the same, it was a very challenging assignment. Ultimately, I believe an ambassador success or failure is measured by the effectiveness with which he or she was able to introduce more realism into the relationship, represented and defended the United States and gained the trust of the host country. And with that, I'd like to uh, conclude by thanking Andrew, Cecily, and Lila for putting together this, this uh, event where we have been planning for quite a while. And of course, uh, thank you all of you for being here. Uh, I did go over my time uh, and listening for 11 minutes and 26 seconds. <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the Wilson Center for organizing this event. I am truly honored. Andrew, I hold it very dear to my heart. Ambassador Wayne, thank you so much. And I'm very honored also to 
present the book along with Dolia Esteves, whose work, whose journalistic work, was very important for those of us who wrote about ambassadors that we overlapped. So, so it is a great occasion. I'm going to talk about two things. First, how this book came about. And second, more or less what I learned I, from participating in this group experience. Well, the, the book started as a conversation with uh, Secretary Marcelo Everard, where he was saying that although everybody asked him about the United States, especially at G20 meetings, there was no um, thorough study about the role of US ambassadors in Mexico. Thinking from his point of view at the beginning of the administration, I don't know how he thinks now, that most of the negotiations were carried out in Mexico City, and therefore it was important to, to study from an academic point of view. We, we both knew the work Dolia had done before, and uh, to look at it in a historical perspective, starting with the 19th century. So uh, I got the instructions. Ambassadors always follow instructions to approach El Colegio de México, both the alma mater of the Secretary Everard and myself, to see if the El Colegio was interested in gathering the experts to accomplish this task. Uh, Silvia Yorguli, the president of El Colegio de, Mexi uh, de México, was very forthcoming immediately, and she really approached the people who were crucial for the book to come about. She talked to two historians from the Center for uh, Historic uh, Affairs of El Colegio, Erika Pani, who's an uh, expert in the beginning and mid 19th century, and Paolo Rigusi, who's expert in s the second part of the 19th century and the Mexican Revolution, the beginning of the 20th. And uh, Celia Toro, who is familiar to this house, and uh, I share with her, we are not only, a, we not only did to get our undergraduate work at El Colegio, we both went to Stanford as graduate students and we both headed the Diplomatic Academy of the Foreign Ministry for a while. So we have a lot in common. Well, the first task was which ambassadors, because you have over 60 representatives and ambassadors over two centuries. And what we decided to do is not to look at the persons, at the figure of the ambassador, no matter how famous or infamous, or no matter how flamboyant <coughs> or brilliant or disliked or liked, but at the issues. Which were the crucial issues in the bilateral relationship throughout the two centuries? And which were the issues that made a change, that gave a different quality to the, to the relationship. So that's how we started thinking about it. We discussed, well, wars are important. Of course, the Mexican-American War is important, but also the First and Second World War and the Cold War, how the two countries bonded together to face the external threat. So we started looking at the different situations that we decided that were important. And once we got uh, to decide which were the issues we were going to look out, we went out to search who were the experts who already knew about the historical period, about the bilateral relationship, who could write the book, because what is extraordinary is that we did this in about a year's time. Through a very hard or interesting seminar work where we all got together to discuss each of the work of the other one and gave our opinions. The, fir the first kickoff seminar was headed nonetheless, no, no other but by Marcelo Ebert himself to show the interest and the concern he had on the subject. So finally, uh, we, did, we became a group of 15 authors we looked at 17 ambassadors, so one essay encompasses three, another one two. And of course, most of all of us were linked to the Colegio, either because we studied there or some work there. And although we only looked at the work of 
male ambassadors. Uh, of course, there's only been one female ambassador, Roberta Jacobson, and we, did, we didn't uh, review her work. Well, uh, we came to diversity with the uh, authors. So we were eight women, seven men, 13 Mexicans, one US citizen, and one Italian. And uh, we have to search, of course, other institutions, mainly UNAM, Instituto Mora, that studies the 19th century, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Amy Greenberg, and uh, Universidad Anáhuac. So uh, let me try to, to summarize for you what I think we learned uh, I, I, I can't speak for everybody who participated in the project, so I'll speak for myself. But I, I am indebted to the whole group because I don't think I would have reached these conclusions about we, how we can study the bilateral relationships, which are the main periods and which are the main contentious or cooperation issues all along. So I would say that... Um, there are mainly five stages when we look at the bilateral relationship. The first one, from the beginning of, the, uh, of uh, Mexico's independence in 1821 to the Civil War in the United States, it was a very contentious bilateral relationship. Uh, beginning with uh, the ambassadorship of Joel Poinsett, the first US ambassador who was kindly requested to leave, uh, uh, to, to the ones following. And th there's, there's a structural reason for this, is that as long as the United States was expanding its territory, and to a great extent, the foreign policy making process was in the hands of Southerners, and most of the gentlemen appointed as ambassadors to Mexico were Southerners and where their main instructions were to acquire territory, it was very difficult to get along. Uh, that was the case of Poinsett, who had instructions to buy Texas, which was not acceptable. Uh, Nicholas Trist, who disobeyed instructions and decided to sign the treaty as he first uh, had uh, was told to do by President Polk, but that, uh, well, he was fired because he didn't go further on as the historical circumstance changed into asking more all of Mexico. Uh, James Gadsden, John Forsyth, Robert McLean, which are the ones that we review, they were all Southerners, and m many of them were planters, and many of them owned slaves. So they were very keen and attached to that peculiar institution. And of course, the fact that Mexico declared in its independence to be a, free, a country free of, slave, of slaves, and there was a very contentious issue of whether Mexico was going to turn back escaped the slaves from the United States, relations were very difficult. The first beginning, the first understanding comes with Thomas Corwin that we review the, at the, as the Civil War advances and of course until Lincoln and Juarez uh, declare a friendship. Now things don't go in a progression, a straight progression, because afterwards, with, after Juarez with President Lerdo de Tejada, he didn't want good or any relations with the United States. Uh, he always said, between the powerful and the weak, the desert. He didn't want the railroads to connect Mexico and the United States. He didn't want US investment. He, didn't, he wanted the desert between Mexico and the United States. But then, came Porfirio Diaz, and with his long presidency, his almost eternal presidency of 30 years, that is when Mexico and the United States started talking. And that's where cooperation began. Sp began with cooperation to pacify the border. The border was a very dangerous region because of uh, Indian nations being pushed west or being from the United States or north from Mexico. So there was uh, very difficult times with the Apaches. 
and the Comanches, and also because of the stealing of cattle from both sides of the border and people doing crimes in one side of the border and moving to the other side. So it was not until uh, uh, Diaz decided that this was going to stop and that he was going to take control of the border, and two generals did a fantastic job right there at the border, uh, Jerónimo Treviño on the Mexican side and Edward Ord on the U.S. side, that they started cooperating and pacifying the border, that we really start a second new stage of Mexico-U.S. relationships of friendship that, of course, is, was culminated with the first visit ever of an American president to Mexico, uh, the Diaz Taft interview, which is historic. Probably, I think, that it's the first interview of two presidents of any countries in the world. First of all, because there were few presidents at that time. There were more kings and queens. And second, because it was not so easy to travel. Well, that uh, friendship continued. Uh, we look at the uh, work of uh, the, the ambassadorship of John Foster, and then of Henry Fletcher during the Mexican Revolution, quite extraordinary. And uh, of course, the Mexican Revolution brought new issues to the relationship that made it challenging, as Dolia would say. <laughs> Of course, the Constitution of 1917 made it difficult uh, when it re with regards to the ownership of land and uh, because of uh, agrarian reform, but the very important issue of the decreed by the Mexican Constitution that the uh, subsuelo, the uh, underland, was belonged to the state, going back to the Spanish tradition. And that affected, of course, of course, oil and mining. And there we have read two very interesting and challenging ambassadors that we reviewed, Dwight Morrow and Josephus Daniels, uh, dealing with oil issues and dealing with land reform in Mexico. So uh, that brings us to what would be the, the a new stage of cooperation that starts with the Second World War when finally Mexico and the United States decide to look together to the challenge that is brought in from outside, from the threat of the European war and the Asian war, and both countries join uh, together. In very complex series of agreements that for the first time allow for the mass movement of Mexican labor force to the United States and agreements of supply of uh, special materials and uh, all, all sorts of needs that they, uh, the, uh, of war needs. And uh, this continued and uh, throughout the Cold War, especially, I look upon the, the ambassadorship of Francis B. White as being really important in terms of, uh, he was representing the United States before the government of Miguel Aleman, the first civilian president that started industrialization, and uh, asked support for the United States for this industrialization through credit, which was not at first looked upon as something propitious by, by experts. Raising tariffs and um, building protected economies was not the big the advice, but soon, the, uh, especially the, the in, uh, investment, uh, U.S. investment in Mexico started to do very well with protected economies. So uh, the end of the Cold War was not an easy moment. Uh, Ambassador John Gavin had a very contentious uh, uh, stay in Mexico. There were disagreements between Mexico and the United States on Central America, on the origin of the conflict in Central America. And uh, yes, I'll conclude just saying that the last <laughs> stage starts in 1994 with the signing of NAFTA. And that's where economic integration, that era that we are today now. So this is more or less what I wanted to, to say. Uh, I think there'll be more time for questions and answers to, to dwell upon the issues. Thank you very much.
journalist hate, we absolutely hate when somebody passes a paper <laughs> or makes a sign telling us to conclude an interview. So I apologize for that, <laughs> Ambassador. Thank you very much for uh, <laughs> both yes. of the presentations. I would like to now yes. ask our panelists to come up uh, and introduce them as well. Please, Ambassador John Feely and Kimberly Breyer here. And of course, I uh, say hello again to Dr. Luis Tuey Etelles via Zoom. Are you listening? Um, are you hearing us okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Well, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to uh, read a bio. I would like to say that, of course, the uh, um, a more a more in-depth bio of uh, our panelists today, as well as Ambassador Laju and uh, Dolia, is available in the website of the uh, Wilson Center's uh, Mexico Institute, and that the audience, either whether they are here or online, are uh, uh, going to, to be having the opportunity to make questions. So for our virtual audience, please send any questions to us via email at mexico at wilsoncenter.org, mexico at wilsoncenter.org, or via Twitter at Mexico Institute, at Mexico mm -hmm. Institute. Well, yes. thank you very much for being here again. Ambassador John Feely is the Executive Director for the Center for Media Integrity of the Americas. John Feely is a former U.S. Ambassador dedicated to promoting greater mutual understanding between the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean. During a 28-year State Department career, he served as Ambassador to Panama, Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge uh, d'Affaires in Mexico City and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. He was formerly a principal at Gotham Lights LLC and a political consultant for the Spanish language media Univision, providing on-air analysis and publishing opinion columns. He has appeared on CNN, BBC, CBC, NPR, PBS, MSNBC, and in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the New Yorker, among other Spanish and English language media. Prior to his foreign service career, he served as United States Marine Officer and Helicopter Pilot. He is a graduate of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and a distinguished graduate of the National War College. Welcome, Ambassador John Feely. Thank you so much. Luis Telles has served as Senior Advisor and Head of Mexico for KKR and Co., a global investment firm. He also serves as co-chair to the Mexico Institute's Advisory Board. Prior to this, he served in several roles in government and private sector, such as the Chairman and CEO of the Mexican Stock Exchange, Mexico's Secretary of Communications and Transportation, Secretary of Energy, Head Economist at Mexico's Treasury Department, and Chief of Staff to President Ernesto Cedillo Ponce de Leon. He holds a degree from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, ITAM, and a PhD in Economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Thank you very much, Dr. Tellez, for being here with us virtually. And last but not least, Kimberly Breyer, uh, who is a senior advisor at the law firm Covington and Berlin LLP. She has more than 20 years of experience in foreign policy, primarily focused on uh, Western Hemisphere Affairs, including as Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the United States Department of State. After a decade in the U.S. intelligence community focused on Latin America, Ms. Breyer launched an extensive career leading country risk assessment teams for private clients in Mexico, Argentina, and Chile. Prior to her government service, Ms. Breyer was a senior fellow and director of the National Policy Association's North American Committee, a trilateral business and labor committee with members from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. She holds a master's degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a BA in Spanish from Middlebury College. Thank you very much for being here, Kimberly. Well, you have heard uh, what, what they have said, but we are also celebrating this year, 200 years of bilateral relations. The perspective of the U.S. ambassadors is important. You were a deputy uh, ambassador, but in your role, and I know that very well, you were uh, able to manage the behind the scenes in, in very, very, very critical moments in the war against organized crime launched by President Calderon, for example, uh, which is when we met. and. Um, in, in other positions. 
And Kimberly, of course, uh, being in the Western Hemisphere affairs, also had a leading role in decision making and in the bilateral relation. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Luis, Tuelle, uh, Luis Telles knows the relation very well. Could, could we have your take uh, on where the relation is right now, uh, according to your experience and uh, your two cents on what could change <laughs> the relation in a better direction or what could benefit the, the uh, relation? If we could start with Dr. Luis Telles, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I was in mute, on mute. Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to congratulate uh, Dolia and uh, the team that Roberta headed for having uh, written a, an extraordinary, two extraordinary books, which uh, really epitomize the task of the uh, Woodrow Wilson Institute, which is uh, bringing the two countries together. Uh, I almost wrote the book uh, uh, writing about uh, the, way the, uh, the two books because they, they are very, uh, they, they're a necessary piece for those who, who will uh, be studying U.S.-Mexican relations in, in the future. I think that um, I, I would like to say some of the things uh, I thought about. Uh, I think one of the most important issues is that uh, the, the task of a diplomat is to maintain one's country's uh, prerogative while strengthening uh, the friendliness, the ties of friendliness that, that they exist, whether they be large or whether they be uh, small. And uh, U.S. ambassadors have uh, moved uh, in, in, most of, in most of the cases, uh, have really tried to uh, strengthen relationships under very different circumstances, as uh, Ambassador Laju uh, very clearly uh, stated. Uh, there has been there have been villains uh, who are uh, clearly uh, mentioned in Me Mexican and uh, U.S. history books. I don't know about U.S. history books, but uh, Henry Lane Wilson is the ultimate villain in in, in this uh, in this story, and uh, Dwight Morrow and Josephus Daniels, and I think the uh, the last ambassadors. Uh, uh, that uh, Dolia uh, interviewed have all contributed to strengthening the relationship. So uh, what's happening today is is uh, a result of, uh, of of a long history and uh, especially of the last forty or fifty years, where relationships uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico has become enormously complex. Uh, at the beginning. The ambassador, uh, I wouldn't say, as Dolia said, was a proconsul, but had uh, enormous decision power. And now the ambassador uh, really helps out uh, the different policymakers, both in the U.S. and Mexico, uh, to reach agreements to uh, forge uh, the relationship. I would like to, uh, just to mention uh, one specific uh, historical episode that I lived through which was uh, the 1994-1995 uh, financial crisis, where uh, we negotiated directly with uh, the White House and then the Treasury. But Jim Jones was uh, always there when he was needed, and he was always there to help and uh, push a solution, which at the end uh, avoided the collapse and the uh, financial uh, blowing up of uh, the Mexican economy. Where is the relationship now? I think it's a very uh, difficult relationship, uh, but it's a, it's a relationship that has been built on institutions. I think uh, NAFTA or uh, the following uh, USMCA is very strong. And uh, as we have seen in the last days, it uh, clearly uh, signals out and uh, is a a, a threshold uh, uh, that uh, started in 1994 and uh, is continuing under different has continued under different presidents and uh, has been supported very openly by uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador. I think uh, on the on the other issues, uh, migration, security, uh, things are more complicated than they were, and uh, they have turned uh, to be. Uh, every time more complicated. And uh, I, 
I do consider that uh, currently uh, the relationship is uh, at a crossroads, uh, independently of uh, what the press says and uh, what different government officials uh, say. And it's, uh, it's really uh, the complexity of the relationship which uh, can turn uh, one way or, or, or the other in terms of uh, what, we, what we want in the Woodrow Wilson, what we uh, have as a goal, which is uh, strengthening the relationship between the two countries. I would stop there. Thank you very much, Luis. John, sure. just let me provoke you a little bit. He, nah, he, say, he, says, uh, <laughs> he says he says uh, Luis says that the relation is based on institutions, but the institutions of Mexico, at least security institutions, are a bit weak. What do you think about that? What happens yeah. when that? What happens when that? What, when that happens? Well, what happens is what Dolia explained earlier, um, and what the ambassadors, in their own words, talked about. Um, first of all, let me begin by congratulating Dolia and Roberta both and her colleagues at the Colegio de Mexico. Um, these two books are really significant contributions to, to the canon of U.S.-Mexico bilateral relations. And um, you know, what's more important is for a bunch of policy wonks gathered here on a beautiful day, they're really fun to read. Both of them were really great reads. And that's important uh, to, to broaden the understanding of the relationship. To speak specifically to your question, um, where is the relationship now? I think Dolia said it best. Um, it's at a challenging moment. That's Diplo speak for it's really not going that well. It could be a lot better, and we're all hoping it will get better. Um, and I think some of the historical work um, that was done both through the interviews and through the analytical and, and academic essays shows us why. I always felt in the well, close to seven years that I had the privilege of working in Mexico at the embassy was that the relationship always suffered from what I used to call the, the, the emboscada breakdown syndrome. And what do I mean by that? Um, Mexicans in the modern era, um, but going back, frankly, in the historical era, we're, we're always suspicious, are always suspicious of American motives. And in particular, when I talk about the emboscada, right, the, the, the ambush syndrome, um, Mexican presidents, I get it, uh, presidents and leaders, they are living in fear of the next uncoordinated, unannounced, unbriefed screw-up by the United States. And it always comes, almost always comes, in the area of law enforcement and cooperation in law enforcement or security issues, precisely where, Ariel, you mentioned that the institutions are weak. So you can go back, and Dolia listed, you know, most of them. I'll go back even further, Casablanca. Does anybody remember that in 95? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Alvarez Machain, um, Fast and Furious, a complete disaster. Um, take a look at, uh, at, at the recent, you know, detention of General Cienfuegos. Um, I mean, one of the horrible things about those ambushes, if you will, and that's how the Mexicans see them, is that in most cases the American ambassadors are also ambushed. So I think there's an institutional problem on the United States side as well. And, and frankly, I would say as a, as, a, as a diplomat and as somebody who once was a chief of mission and understands that the instructional letter from the president of the United States says you are responsible for all federal activities in that country, I, I say it is to the great discredit of the sprawling law enforcement and intelligence bureaucracies in Washington that we sadly keep surprising the Mexicans with these things. It seems like one of them comes along every time. And, you know, Calderón put it best when, when he was asked after Carlos Pascual um, was forced to leave after the WikiLeaks uh, uh, scandal. Um, they said, do you still, or, or I guess it, the it wasn't when he had left. It was right after it had broken. He hadn't gone yet. And uh, they asked President Calderón, do you still trust Carlos Pascual? And his answer was, trust takes a long time to develop, but you can blow it in a minute. And that's what consistently happens. And I have to say my own opinion, and I don't know if it's academically supported, but is that every single ambassador, and I worked for seven of them, <laughs> they were all my bosses, and I'm a friend and a fan of all of them. And one of the great things about these books is that even I found out new stuff about them. 
but um, every one of them struggled with breaking down that barrier of confianza, whether it was with a president or a foreign minister or in the Cancillería. And again, you look back historically and, and you can understand why. I think there are some very good things about the relationship. I don't mean to be completely negative, but I will hold it for the next que round of questions and we can talk about that. Thank you very much, Ambassador Philly. Kimberly? Thank you, and thank you so much for being here. And I, I too, I just want to join on the, on the, on the books um, and say how important I think they are uh, for, um, for understanding and learning and for, for outgoing ambassadors. I think every outgoing U.S. ambassador should take these books as their instruction manual of, you know, of the history of the two countries. I, I recently wrote an article uh, last end of last year in the Inter-American Law Review about diplomacy and corporate government affairs. And one of the things we did as, as part of that process was research. We did a, sort of a, a review of literature about what's out there about sort of diplomacy and how, how are the stories being told. And the review of literature didn't take very long because there isn't much. Uh, and so, of course, there are seminal books like uh, Ambassador David Au's Baron Porcupine. There, you know, there are other important texts, but I think these are gonna, going to go down in history as, as really critical texts for understanding firsthand the way that things unfold in the bilateral relationship. So I thank you for, for doing that and for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, so when, when Andrew mentioned that he wanted sort of a, a diversity of, of uh, views, um, I took it as, it could be taken a number of ways, but I took it as he wanted someone who's been on the Washington side of things all of this time. And so um, just, I, I was trying to get it straight in my own mind. I've been in the U.S. government working on Mexico under Ambassadors Landau, Jacobson, Garza, David Au, and Jones. Um, and was in the private sector under Ambassador Wayne and now under Ambassador Salazar. And all of those jobs have involved Mexico one way or the other. So, so I, but I've been on the DC side of it, uh, traveling to Mexico, of course, but really on the DC uh, policy side. Um, so the, the result of that is that my views, I guess, are somewhat different in some places than some of the ambassadors. But what I come away with, and there's a th theme throughout the, the more recent chapters um, in, in Dolia's book, that you know, policy is sort of made in Washington. And, and even Ambassador Jacobson in her section says, I'm the implementer. You know, the policy is in Washington. Ambassador Landau said he used to come here every two or three months because he wanted to check in and make sure that he was part of the process. I will say that you know my view of the ambassadors might be um, more enthusiastic than some of the ambassadors themselves. I think they're really important, and I think they should ab be absolutely engaged because, you know, as has has been pointed out, there are a lot of bad ideas uh, that come out, and I think we really need the ambassadors to be integrally involved in in the policy uh, process. And I loved in um, in David Au's book his chapter about all the people from Washington who visit. He calls it visits from Planet Washington, um, because you know he assumes that it's you know it's sort of a different world up here, and, and I think that's, you know, that's really important. Um, I will say something um, that I don't think is controversial, because I've said it before, but um, I don't think the U.S. government is very well coordinated on Mexico policy. I think we're really bad at it. And I think it, your comments, um, you know, reflected that as well. I think we end up with all these different issues and, and sort of a lack of, of cohesive uh, approach and different administrations have been better or worse at this for you know for different reasons. But in general, our organizational structure in the U.S., in my view, is not really conducive to having a coherent uh, policy. And just one story that that I've told briefly um, before is when I was on the White House staff during the Bush 43 administration, I made a terrible mistake. And the mistake was I tried to convene a policy meeting on Mexico. PCCs were sort of the, the lower level um, of, of uh, interagency coordination. We reserved a room, and the room was overflowing. There were people down the hall. We couldn't fit all of the people from all of the agencies working on Mexico in a room. <laughs> Right, and that you know that was a, a moment, a aha moment for me, where I understood, you know, this is this is a whole different animal, and we need to have a different structure uh, in order to address it. So, so I think you know where we are in Mexico. You know, I'll get to your question. I want to make one other point, which is. Throughout the book, there are comments about media. I'm surrounded by media. Um, uh, but I will say, you know, I think um, there is a tendency for, especially in the 24-hour cable news cycle of both sides, frankly. Um, and I think in, you know, now with Twitter, where we're just, you know, constantly everything is being updated every second, um, you know, handling the media piece of the relationship is very, very difficult. Um, I've worked with the PAN, I've worked with the PRI, nah. I've worked with Morena. It's very <laughs> challenging to, you know, to, to make sure that you're able to tell sort of the full, um, the full story. So that is something that really permeates all the chapters. 
chapters, and, and I think it's really important and really something that, um, that we need to think about as countries is how do we handle the public diplomacy uh, a role. Um, the other thing I noticed, in, and I think I have an idea for your next book, which is to talk about the role of the Congresses. Um, there are some mentions in the NAFTA chapter and the Merida um, issues, but there's not much about Congress, so I think it would be great to do your next book on the roles of uh, key members of Congress. Um, <laughs> and so, um, in terms of where we are now, to get to your question, look, I concur. I think we're at a, I think we're at a challenging time. I think that I will give the Biden administration credit for rebuilding, and I think Luis was referring to the bilateral institutions. Um, so I think they've done a good job of, of building the, the dialogues and the mechanisms for coordination. And the question is then under that, um, what, what are the results gonna be? And I don't, think we have the, I don't think we have the luxury anymore of having a lot of really nice meetings. I think we have to get results. And so that's really where the question is. We have you know, a couple more years left of the current administration in Mexico. You know, what can we do? What can we do in that time? And do we see the relationship as an opportunity to advance on things? Or are we just kind of you know, managing and trying to put out the latest fire? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask Dolia and Roberta if they would like to do, uh, to, they have some comments very briefly, two, three minutes each, please. Uh, on, on uh, what our panelists just said. No, I totally agree with both. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I agree entirely with what they said. I don't have anything to add, and I thank you for those words. Um, I would like to give more opportunity for, because we're sort of yeah. running late. Thank you very much for that. I don't... Any, uh, I mean, I can answer some questions if there were some questions from the past. That's a very journalist-like. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, thank you for, for the comments about the book. Uh, I also sat during four years at the uh, North American uh, desk in, at the Mexican Foreign Ministry, and of course, it was absolutely shocking when things that were unexpected happened. Uh -huh. But I have to say that the, uh, the fear of all sums came for, uh, during the, the Trump administration. Yeah. I mean, it was not isolated events. It was a whole rhetoric that we have not evaluated the damage that it did to the Mexico-U.S. relationship. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it almost became, um, I mean, one of the things I always thought was, where you saw ambassadors, and I agree, ambassadors are primarily implementers and policy is made in capitals and they have a role in the, in the formulation of it, but they implement. But where ambassadors have a tremendous role, and <clears throat> Ambassador Wayne knows this and you know this, is precisely when things go wrong and how do you react. And the fact is that I think with the rhetoric and the, just a complete change during the Trump administration of how the president himself spoke about Mexico, turned the last 40 years of collaboration on its head, and folks got very scared. And yet, we saw there was, as, was, as Chris Lando and Roberta Jacobson both referred to, there was a very constant channel of communication, but it was reduced to two guys. And that's not institutional, and that's a problem. Well, I'd like to remind our audience uh, that's not here, the ones who are watching us through Zoom, that they could send their questions to Mexico at wilsoncenter.org or via Twitter at, at Mexico Institute, Mexico at wilsoncenter.org or via Twitter at Mexico Institute. I am going to open for questions now. I, mean, I would like to, to make a, a comment. I think the, oh, please. The, US ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, and by the way, the Mexican ambassador uh, today, uh, contemporary ambassadors have uh, really a monumental task in uh, steering the relationship and uh, just keeping in, being informed of what's happening with the relationship. Uh, things uh, have changed so much uh, at least uh, maybe uh, before this administration, where uh, the relationship uh, has been streamlined to uh, Marcelo Obrard. But uh, in uh, the previous administrations, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of Communications, the Secretary of uh, Education, and so forth, 
all of them have had direct contacts with their own, and, and of course, uh, the whole security uh, establishment had direct contacts with their U.S. counterparts. And uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury would call uh, whoever was his counterpart and uh, would discuss a, a, a certain, certain conditionality in the case we were under those conditions or would... Uh, discuss certain cooperation towards uh, Central America and so forth. So uh, the task of both ambassadors, uh, just understanding what was going on, and uh, I, I uh, and Landau put it, puts it uh, very well, he had to go to Washington every certain time uh, to understand what the, what the policies were, because uh, things have changed enormously. And the U.S. ambassador or Mexican ambassador, for that matter, is not necessarily uh, well informed of uh, what his colleagues in Mexico or the cabinet in Mexico or the different government agencies are doing. So um, I, I would say that uh, you, you really uh, need to uh, have a person who is very active and very well informed and uh, uh, tries to get command of the different uh, agencies in terms of what they do with uh, with Mexico in the case of the U.S. and uh, in the Mexican case with uh, with the U.S. So the, the relationship, uh, I, I know the ambassadors. Uh, I agree with John. Uh, they implement policies, but they have to understand what the policy is, and sometimes uh, the policy is not at their disposal. So. Uh, it's a very challenging job, and uh, interestingly enough, when when things are not uh, going the way uh, we would all like them to go, uh, like um, during some parts of this administration and other administrations, the ambassador is key uh, to uh, promote uh, what I just mentioned uh, at the beginning, the friendliness that exists, and, and for that he uses his knowledge, uh, most of ambassador, most of the current ambassador, is, uh, the, the the ones that Dolia uh, very uh, interestingly uh, talked to, uh, have had a, a thorough knowledge of Mexico, and uh, they their personal charm and the, their personal uh, characteristics are also very important. Uh, personality, sorry, are very important uh, to achieve this. Yeah, that's very important. I remember when I was just a just a personal note when I was in the embassy, that I uh, quite a few quite a few U.S. officials told me our main problem is that we don't know when someone is talking uh, for Mexico because we talk to some official in Secretaría de Hacienda and they tell us one thing. And then we talk to another official in Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores and they tell us another thing. So we don't really know when someone is talking uh, about a subject. Uh, for Mexico, they give us different figures. But I don't remember the, the exact answer that I used to give them. But I do remember that I told them, well, sometimes with the U.S. that also happens. Uh, so I think, I, I think what Luis and John and Kimberly uh, regarding these are, have mentioned about uh, trust and about uh, uh, you know just just be well informed and in command of uh, of the relation with the agencies, especially in these times, is very important. But let me let me go. I'm I'm excited to open the round of questions myself. So let me make a question to each of the panelists very quickly, if you don't mind, Dolia. I'm not going to make you a question about the re the, the bilateral relation and all that because we are journalists and I was. Uh, I must confess, this is something that not normally happens. I must confess that I was incredibly jealous when you obtained the first interview with Landau, even before he took over, for example. Which interview or interviews did you enjoy the most and why? <laughs> well, there are several, uh, of course. I mean, I'm not going to... You, you don't have to be a diplomat. She is the diplomat here. No, okay. no. I, it's because it's several. There it's very hard for me to say I like this better than others because uh, they're all they're, they they are all very unique in my view. Uh, from even from Lucy, who I interviewed, the first ambassador, he was uh, Carter's ambassador. I found him in a home, um, one of these uh, 
como asilos uh, para ancianos uh, in Wisconsin in the middle of the snow. And he was just so smart. <coughs> Uh, and he didn't know ma a lot about Mexico. He just went down there because Carter asked him to go. Uh, but he was so smart, he knew Kennedy. I mean, they, they were all very interested, uh, interesting things to have a relationship, not, uh, not just what I wrote or the transcript, but also spending two hours with this person, uh, with these uh, individuals who were so important uh, for the relationship, uh, and uh, he didn't give me a lot. He didn't recall a lot. Three, four years later, he died, uh, but he said, you know, Mexico was just one thing in my whole career. He was governor of Wisconsin twice, so, and, and then uh, he, he was very active in democratic uh, uh, electoral policies. So each one of them, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, teaching for me. Uh, I learned a lot about them in a personal way. Uh, Gavin, for instance, very arrogant. Uh, he <laughs> refused, he, he just refused to get a picture uh, because I, I tried to, I, I took pictures of all of them, some of them with me that I have, and he said, no pictures, no pictures. Why ambassador? Because ya no estoy tan guapo. <laughs> uh, so he was old. He actually died too a, a few years later. Uh, and so each one, it's, it's, it's a character. They're all characters for me. Uh, I really enjoy talking to them, transcribing, uh, putting together the interviews. Uh, and now if you tell me uh, what, in terms of information, uh, obviously, I don't think any of them gave me something that would be, you know, parar la prensa, no, or uh, front page stories or anything like that. That's why it's a book. It's not an interview. <laughs> and it's not an interview <coughs> with, uh, it's not an interview. It, I went beyond the news cycle, which was very refreshing for me. Hmm. Uh, I think uh, as, as Kim was uh, commenting before we started, I think uh, Jones is very candid. He, he tells me a lot of uh, stuff, I mean juicy stuff uh, <laughs> for, for, for journalists, like that secret, uh, uh, probably uh, Luis knows this, the secret uh, trip that they took in the middle of the bail when Mexico was collapsing, the, the, de the debt crisis, and they took a secret, uh, a trip to Mexico to meet Cedillo, who had recently been inaugurated with Larry Summers uh, and uh, another guy from Treasury. And then Ambassador Jones was waiting for them. And they went at, like at midnight to Los Pinos to meet with Cedillo. They wanted, because Larry Summers wanted to find out if it was worth uh, the United States uh, bailing out Mexico for $10 billion. And uh, who are we giving the money? Who's this guy? So after they met for an hour with Cedillo, a very smart guy, uh, uh, Summer said, oh my God, he's so impressive. He can be a, a president or a governor of any, any central bank in the world. So he came back, uh, but that, that meeting in particular, that trip, which they, they went on a special plane and so forth. It was very secretive because the negotiations were going on under the Clinton administration. So, but Jones is very candid. He tells me a lot of stuff that I didn't know and I cover these events. Um, that's the other thing. Most of them, uh, starting in 89, uh, when I uh, started to, to write uh, for El Financiero, um, I, uh, I, I mean, I cover in real, in real time a lot of these events. So it was very fascinating for me to hear the ver their versions of what I saw as a journalist. So apart from being a journalist, you're a great salesperson, at least for your book. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me open to questions. I just want to say that- Well, uh, it's not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do, well, I that's do, the best part. I, you see, you're a great I, salesperson. I invite everybody to read it, everybody that is interested in the relationship. Uh, let me it. just say uh, to the people that is present here and those who are watching online that 
uh, it would be good. I mean, if you don't, I will try to assign it uh, or see who who answer who wants to answer it. But it it would be good if you tell us uh, to whom you want you are uh, directing your question, and obviously you can direct it to anyone here or to Dr. Luis Tellez uh, virtually. I'm going to start with her, who's been who has her hand raised for a while. Tracy. Tracy. Name name name, please, Tracy, and and. Who do you work for, please? Needs no introduction. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to be formal. <laughs> great, friend of, great friend of ours. Yeah. OK, because I'm such a techno genius. <laughs> I think we can, oh, well, maybe they will not be able to hear you online. No. Tracy Wilkinson. Hello, hello. There. Oh, there I am. Hi, Tracy Wilkinson from the Los Angeles Times. Seven years as bureau chief in Mexico City, <coughs> best job in my 30 years of journalism, and I'm a big fan of Dolia. Um, I wanted to say hi to all of you, and um, very happy to be here. And um, Kim, if you want to talk about the media part, I can help you with that anytime. <laughs> John, what you were talking about, the confianza, which is what I want to um, uh, talk about a little bit in, in my question, which is directed to Dolia. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about, um, and Dolia is, I mean, like she was a source. I mean, she was the person you go to for so much information about, about as a fellow journalist, as a colleague. Um, you talked a lot about the different characteristics of all of these different ambassadors and their different levels of knowledge and expertise and such. So if you had to give a three-sentence um, advice to the next ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Mexico about how to... <laughs> oh, am I putting you on the spot? Sorry. Um, how to gauge the president of Mexico. And I think about this because, because you know, we're looking at AMLO, who is a mystery for many people, <laughs> many of us, and, you know, how you figure him out. And so how, how would you tell uh, an arriving ambassador to figure out the president of Mexico? What are the key points yeah. to look at? Please answer. Well, thank you, Tracy, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, you know, I th believe, and some of these of the ambassadors told me, by the time the new ambassador takes uh, takes their post in Mexico, they have a very good profile of who the president is. There are some guys in Langley that do it, <laughs> and uh, I, I happen to see one many years ago, Carlos Salinas. They were not off. So they know who, they, who they're facing. I would love to see what they have, what the profile of, Lo, of uh, Lo, uh, Lopez Obrador is. I don't think they classify those things um, very, very much. I'll tell you in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what it's right. Like. But I, I think they go, and. Salazar was here, Ambassador Salazar was here a few weeks ago, and, uh, and he said that his job when he was there was to try to understand to the best of his knowledge where uh, Lopez Obrador was taking the country tours. Uh, so um, obviously they got to be friendly. All of, them, uh, all of them spoke about the sensitivities uh, of the Mexican sensitivity. I think it was uh, Negro Ponte who said, es un acto de fe. It's a, it's a, it, you know, you just don't, don't touch that. You have to have like a code of silence. You just can't get involved in internal politics. You can get, uh, forget the oil and the, and, and, the, and Pemex and so forth. Because there's, mm -hmm. and I think all the ambassadors are very aware of that sensitivity. So they, yet they have to navigate uh, in a very, you know, difficult uh, waters. Uh, some of them have done it very well. Ambassador Wayne did it very well, and he worked with two um, two presidents, uh, Calderon, and uh, and what was the other one? Peña, Peña, Nieto. Peña Nieto. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Peña Nieto, mostly Calderón and one year with Peña Nieto. Uh, and uh, so he did it very well. Of course, uh, he came right after uh, Calderón fired pretty much uh, or threw out of the country, uh, Pascual. But what? Oh, I thought something. So anyway, um, 
I think that uh, ambassadors are pretty, uh, are pretty aware of that sensitivity and it makes it very difficult. That's why all of them said it's very challenging to be ambassador, but also very enjoyable, also uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, but de definitely Mexico is a very hard cookie for any diplomat. I have an online question uh, directed for Ambassador Roberta Layu. It says, which common characteristics does a U.S. ambassador uh, to Mexico should have to be successful? And how do does success look like for a U.S. ambassador in Mexico? It's very difficult to, to measure success. Success according to whom? Truth is in the eye of the beholder. It's a, an ambassador, of course, by definition, should be someone who follows instructions from, his, uh, from the State Department. But that doesn't mean that he is uh, following instructions from or, or trying to deliver for the rest of the US government. You have, for example, <laughs> Uh, uh, very well liked ambassador in Mexico, Josephos Daniels. He, the, the State Department didn't like him at the end. They totally sidestepped him and dealt with the Mexican ambassador here in Washington. The president liked him. He didn't need anything else. The president probably told him, take care of the Mexicans. That sounds like Salazar. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. But uh, it's, you know, Nicolas Trist. He was, he's very much liked in Mexico, but he was fired and he never got his salary in many years and he was very badly treated in spite of the fact that he delivered what originally Paul asked him. So it's very difficult that when, how, you know, um, also ambassadors are judged differently over time mm -hmm. than at the moment. That's so right. you want to be popular, you want to go native, maybe you don't, uh, they don't, they won't like you back home for doing that. So it's very difficult to evaluate. Thank you. Two minutes, please, each for closing remarks. Luis Telles. Thank you. Well, uh, as I said, uh, I think the, the role of the U.S. Amb ambassador is key. Uh, I was in that flight, by the way, uh, Dolia, uh, coming from uh, Washington. The, the U.S. was going to lend us not 10 billion, 30 billion dollars and President Cedillo was not known. So uh, Summers, uh, Summers flew, uh, I think with David Lipton, I don't remember, but uh, Ambassador Jones was uh, there, myself and, uh, and uh, uh, Undersecretary uh, Summers. And we came to see President Cedillo, who was, I mean, he, he, he didn't want to have the meeting, but he had the meeting and we got the $30 billion. So it was, it, it, it was a good interchange. Uh, but I, I would say uh, U.S. ambassadors, if uh, they are, uh, if they get to know the country or they know the country before and they were, they are uh, well versed in in, in uh, Mexican affairs and have the proper personality. Um, I agree with you. John Gavin was uh, extremely arrogant, and the relationship did not go well. And uh, the other ambassadors, uh, John Negroponte, Jim Jones, my colleague, uh, Tony Wayne, my, my good friend, Tony Garza, my good friend, uh, Roberta Jacobson, all of them were uh, had a wonderful and uh, uh, really uh, a very strong and uh, likable personality. And it's, uh, it's they who have uh, actually, at the end of the day, a, a role to, to uh, strengthen the relationship and... Uh, undo the the uh, the bad things or or, or the mistakes that uh, have been done in, in both uh, in both governments and uh, to create a policy and uh, my view is uh, the ambassadors do play a role and they they do have a very important role to play in what i think is uh, the most difficult uh, relationship of a of an ally of two allies in the world thank you John Feely? Sure. Ambassador? Two quick thoughts. Um, the, first, um, the first is that, and I may take a little different tack here, um, the first is that on the issue of um, confianza, um, it cuts both ways. One of the very difficult things that an ambassador, a U.S. ambassador has to do is sort of justify why they're engaging with whom in Mexico at what time. 
And in that regard, it can be a very, very difficult sell, if you will, especially in law enforcement and in security issues. Um, the second observation that I would have is precisely that the inside-outside game. Every U.S. ambassador has to have an inside and an outside game. What do I mean? Inside that embassy on Reforma, there's close to 40 government agencies. It's the largest embassy that we have around the world. And you've got to pay attention to what's going on inside because that's where you're going to get surprised. That's where we consistently do get surprised. Then there's the outside game, and increasingly the outside game now includes your Twitter. Roberta was very popular with Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something that's really interesting just about this conversation here today in the inside-outside game, and we're looking at the American ambassadors and that. In all the time I spent in Mexico, the two words I heard the most when I went over to SRE were paridad, soberanía. I heard them until I was sick of them, but I learned to pay attention to them because that's what they really cared about, paridad y soberanía. And so my question it's not really a question, but my observation is we have two great books here, really fantastic, in-depth studies of the American ambassadors. ¿Dónde está la paridad? ¿Dónde están los libros de los embajadores mexicanos en Washington? Okay? They're, they're not there. And what that points up to me is one of the enduring challenges of any ambassador from the United States who goes to Mexico. The United States, in many ways, is terribly ignorant of Mexico and Mexicans. And that means broadly, but it's also within inside the policy structure. And on the other hand, Mexicans are obsessed with the gringos. La simetría. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Kimberly. Thank you. Just three quick points. Um, one thing that strikes me a bit is the, the amount to which the, the interviews in the book, the ambassadors are talking about their management role, which is the, you know, the role that John was just talking about. Managing this thing is you know, more than a full-time job. One of the things that, I, that I've said to a few U.S. ambassadors that they've been outgoing is that I think we need to have more ambition than just m managing the pieces. I think we need a vision, and we need, to, we, we need to really be thinking about how we're not just going to kind of keep, keep every issue, you know, keep all the plates in the air, you know, juggling, but we need to figure out where we want to take this thing and have a broader vision for it. So I think that's really important. And to your question about, you know, what I would tell any outgoing ambassador, I think that's one of the things. Um, the second is, you know, I differ uh, somewhat with some of the, the comments and, and things that are in the book and that have been said. I think the role of the White House has always been critical in the, the Mexico relationship. And if you look at every <coughs> inflection point from NAFTA to Merida to the Iraq War uh, to immigration to the Trump administration, you, you've had a moment where the White House role to the, uh, the economic uh, policies and the summer's visit, you know, you, that White House role is always really important. Really important. And for me, you know, I think I think there's a structural issue there that I've written about before. But I think it's I, I have a slightly different view that I don't think that just because a White House is involved that means that somehow the regular institutions are not. I don't think it's a zero sum game. Um, the other is, I would say, um, I think diplomacy, modern diplomacy as I see it is obviously about you know, dealing with foreign uh, governments and all of the key officials, presidents, cabinet ministers, but I think it's about a lot more than that, and it's about civil society, and it's about you know, NGOs and business and all of the things that we have to manage every day, as John was saying, sort of the outward piece. Um, for me, you know, the first book on diplomacy was, is seen to be the, this book, Negotiating with Princes, you know, and, and it goes back uh, many, many years uh, to the French. Um, but I think these days, modern diplomacy is really quite a different thing. And so the ambassador has to be very multi-skilled at being able to deal with all kinds of constituencies. And of course, dealing with the presidents and cabinet secretaries is really important. But it is a lot more than that on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Any final remarks? Anything you would like to say? Oh, yes. Well, I just uh, want to say that I'm very happy to have changed what I originally planned to do. I was originally meant to write a piece on John Gavin because during those four years I was uh, Directora General para América del Norte. And uh, it was a very difficult time, and I don't remember it as something very agreeable, probably challenging. <laughs> and I'm very glad I changed to, to the NAFTA issue and that I met two, well, got to discuss many things with two wonderful ambassadors, Ambassador Negroponte and Ambassador Jones. And they taught me, each one, something special. Negroponte said, to be a good ambassador, and I think that applies to US-Mexico, but 
to any ambassador. You have to erase your personality and just try to communicate the two countries. You don't get to perform yourself. You just get the other, the two countries and the two uh, bureaucracies and the societies together. And Jim Jones just said very briefly, an ambassador has to listen more and talk less. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good. To. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, one of the other things that uh, I think the, the interviews uh, give a very good uh, picture of is um, how, Im how important or influential is the relationship of the ambassador with the president. And then you have the, pre uh, the, the ambassadors that are, are career people who usually know what they're going to do once they get there. Uh, like Jacobson and Davido, they told me, um, when I asked, I asked them, uh, did the president give you clear instructions of what you, your, your mission down there is? No, I think they knew what, what they, he knew what, what, what the mission, that he knew that I knew what the mission was, uh, and so forth. And then you have the political appointees. Uh, Landau takes an issue with that. He believes that m perhaps the political appointees are better than the, than the career people because uh, they can think out of the box and so forth. So I found that particularly uh, interesting. Nevertheless, it doesn't have to be whether a career person or a political person or political appointee to be a uh, good ambassador. And uh, frankly, I think all of them, all of the uh, 12 that I interview, they really try to, to improve Mexico, the Mexican relationship. Gavin is his own way, he was too arrogant, he was, he's the one that outstands more, uh, but uh, and it was the Cold War and it was a very difficult uh, time at that point. But nevertheless, I think they all try in their way to, uh, to improve the relationship. Some of them were very good at it, like <coughs> uh, Ambassador Wayne, que desnar cuautizó la agenda, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but um, but uh, anyway, the, the book is to be read for by all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much on behalf of the uh, Goodrow Wilson's Mexico Institute, and of course, the panelists, and Dolia, and Ambassador Laju, of course, Kimberly, Luis, and Ambassador Philly. Thank you very much for your attention. This concludes our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, and, and uh, I, I think maybe all of you are aware. If you're not aware, we're going to have a, a uh, brief reception uh, just outside this room, so you'll have a chance to perhaps we can uh, toast Mexico's Independence Day on uh, Friday the 16th, the 200th anniversary of diplomatic relations, and if we're lucky, maybe Dolia will sign a book or two. <laughs> so, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the panel. Fantastic conversation. Really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. Thank you.